So we're going to talk about the discovery of everything that's associated with the atom. I think we spend a lot of time, there are better YouTube videos that are associated with this, and I'll try to link these to uh, my videos. Again, I'm a pretty much a novice at this, so I'm not promising anything. But I'll try to link the videos at the end of this video so you guys can sort of uh, get an idea, uh, a better idea, a better representation of the experiments that were done here. Um, the first one, the, the first experiment, is the uh, cathode ray tube experiment. Um, the cathode ray tube um, was set up so that if you put a, lar put a large voltage between two plates, one that was negatively charged, one that was positively charged, um, you would get a beam of what's called cathode rays, okay? And the cathode rays would come off and they would aim towards this little hole, towards this little positive thing, and some of them would pass it through this hole, and they'd go through and then hit on this uh, bank of phosphor, and whenever they hit that, it would make a little flash. And what they noticed is that if you applied a magnetic field around this thing, you could deflect whether it increased the positive would attract the electrons one way, or it increased the negative and it would deflect them that direction. Okay, so because of those changes to the magnetic field, they're able to surmise what the actual charge on these cathode rays was. And they knew that the charge was generally going to be a negative charge on any of the cathode ray particles. A <coughs> Millikan. I just want to make sure you spell his name right. So, it, you have to look at these guys. This Millikan guy, um, some of the other people I've read to talk to. His experiment for this time, remember this is the late 1800s, when he thought of this experiment, this is before computers and everything else, figured out, I'm going to figure out the mass of an electron, because or the mass, the, mass, the mass of these cathode particles. And what he did is he took an atomizer, and he vaporized some oil into a fine mist up here, okay? And as this mist was flowing around, he applied a charge to two plates. And the oil vapor would then drip down through the hole that's there. And by varying the amount of charge that's there and observing the rate of descent of the electrons, if he had changed the charge, the descent would change as well. By making these changes, he was able to use mathematically formulas in order to determine the mass of an electron. Remember when I said it was very, very small in the previous video? Uh, in this case, um, the mass of an electron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. Right? And that was the mass of an electron. And he was also able to determine what the charge of an electron was, which was already theorized uh, in the area. I mean, they had a pretty good idea of electricity at this point, but they didn't know the mass of an electron. So that's why this one is actually pretty important. Okay? All right. I'm going to pause this, and we'll talk a little bit about the next one. The next important experiment as far as determining the atomic structure was developed by Ernest Rutherford and is the uh, uh, student of Thompson, if I remember correctly. Um, yep. Thompson was uh, uh, this guy's mentor, Rutherford's mentor. And Thompson's idea, he came to the idea that the atoms, they're spherical in shape, but that sphere itself, it's a big blob of floating positive and negative charges. And, well, not really big. It's a really, really, really small blob of positive and negative charges floating around, depending upon the element that's there. So Rutherford was at, i got to prove my mentor right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a box. And this box has alpha particles, because we just started learning about radiation at this point. And these alpha particles, what we'll do is we'll shoot them through a gold foil. And to if the gold foil is made up of that sea of blob uh, elements, and it should be, that's what his idea was, then we should see nothing but results right here, as this stuff shoots right through 
the gold foil. And sure enough, as these things went penetrated the gold foil, most of them would come by, and most of the phosphor hits, and that means every time it hits, you see a little flash of light. And that was a graduate student's job, was to sit there and count the flashes of light. Fun job, right? So as these things come through, they hit the gold foil. They would come through and hit that gold, they would come through and hit the phosphor paper, they count the number of hits that they got. So Rutherford was like, aha, I'm right. My mentor is right. And wait a minute. What they noticed is that over here on the, goal, on the uh, phosphor paper, they started noticing that there were other hits. And as they repeated the experiment, they took this phosphor paper and they wrapped it around the entire thing and they noticed that there were hits all around behind the box. Okay? This doesn't make any sense because the L particle is a pretty sizable particle. And he likened this thing to saying, well, if I have a 15 caliber, 50, or a uh, 15 caliber bucket bullet, and I shoot it at some toilet paper, and the bullet hits the toilet paper and then bounces straight back. Because this gold foil is pretty thin, these alpha particles are moving pretty fast, everything should just pass right through. So Rutherford looked at this and he said, well, I think my mentor was wrong. This is in the case where, in science, you can't look at it and say, well, these are the expected results. These are the expected results but they're not the actual results. Because what happened was Rutherford looked at this and said, wait a minute, we've done something goofy. All right? Even though this would disprove his mentor's idea, the idea here is to say, look, we've got something that is important. Something has changed. We have to look at this change and incorporate it into science. Okay, that's the scientific method. There are people out there in science right now who look at this and they say, no, my idea is right. And regardless of whatever's out there, your idea is wrong, regardless of the fact that it's being completely disproven by this experiment. Okay? When you're in science, you got to check that ego at the door. And I know it's hard because a lot of us are smart, we're PhDs, that means we're geniuses, right? So as a genius, you know, you get an ego that's associated with it. But here in science, whenever you run an experiment, you have to look at what the experiment says and figure out what exactly is going on. A curious mind is a lot better than an egotistical mind. Rutherford had a curious mind, all right? And what they were able to do is say, aha, <coughs> this experiment has proven that the structure of an atom is a little bit more complex than what we thought. <coughs> most of it's coming through. So what they said was, since most of it's coming through, most of the atom's sphere, most of the sphere, 99% empty space. But there's a little bit that's in there that's deflecting these alpha particles. The little bit that's in there that's deflecting the alpha particles it has to be something that's got mass and something that resists this type of penetrating change by the alpha particles. It turns out what they were found was the nucleus. The nucleus of an atom, okay, is where all the mass is kept. But this means that if you compare the size of the atom and the mass of the atom, the density of the nucleus is incredibly high compared to the rest of the atom, right? Because that's where all the mass is contained. Okay? If you looked at, if you look at a hailstone in the center of a cloud, okay, that cloud doesn't have a lot of weight. But if you look at those hailstones in the center of the cloud, those hailstones, if they're really big, they've got a lot of the mass, okay? Which means that the density of the cloud is centered around those hail particles, okay? So. Rutherford discovered basically the nucleus at that point. All right. One thing that was known in this experiment is that alpha particles, the alpha particle itself has a positive charge. So if it was negative, they'd be attracted to each other and something, something of a combination uh, factor would happen. What Rutherford noticed, and various students noticing that, is that as these alpha particles came close to the nucleus, they experience a repulsive force. And it's just not two things bouncing off each other. Something is rejecting these, using a force to reject that. And since these are positive, it made sense that the nucleus itself was positive, or had some positive charges. And as it turns out, what Rutherford discovered was the proton. Okay? In a similar experiment, Chadwick, who lived in England, I don't know why I said that. 
but he's English. He could do more if he didn't stop for tea all the time. What, what he did is he took alpha particles and he would bombard his sheet of metal with the alpha particles. And what he was noticing is that he was detecting radiation that was impervious to charge. So you would notice that as he, these, the, the, the detection of uh, radiation comes through, the alpha particles would not pass through the metal, but there would be beams of energy that would come through that would not be deflected by the um, positive and minus charge. Another thing that he noticed was that these beams had mass associated with them. So since they had mass and they were not weight, these beams of energy that were not deflected by charge had to be something that was massive and had no charge. So Chadwick discovered a neutron. Okay. So that's how we discovered all of the apps. I will link to these hopefully in a video if I can figure out how these interwebs work.